Aren't you going to be a kid at Christmas again? Guess what, y'all? The kids have left the building. It's just us old folks in here now. If you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 2. We're back in Luke 2. We're going to also look at John 1, and we're going to close in the Old Testament book of Isaiah, chapter 53. Hopefully you got a communion element. We're going to take communion in just a minute. It's going to be a little different service because we're going to lock in some traditions and that we as a church are not very traditional, but there are a few things that I want us to do to have it transcend a little bit further than that. So last week I wanted you to complete the sentence. Just simple idea. I like the idea. It's a really kind of creative idea. It gets us thinking. Christmas is. That's what we've, not, we've entitled this little series. Christmas is. You fill in the blank. What would you say? Christmas is. We, we went to Tanger, Pastor Matt, Mason, they, we showed that video last week. They went to Tanger and shoved a microphone in people's faces, and we would never thought we would have all these very Christian people at Tanger Outlet here, and everybody said Jesus. And, and yet I asked you guys a couple weeks ago, I said, hey, be, be anonymous, just write down on your communication card, what is Christmas? And y'all wrote stressful, uh, you wrote depressing, I love our church, I mean, we're honest, lonely, boring. Three people wrote boring. Wonderful. Work, exhausting, busy, misunderstood, complicated, getting old, bittersweet, just another year. That's about as far from that video as we can possibly be. So what is Christmas? And so I had my little hoodie on last week. I thought that was a nice little creative thing that I bought on Amazon. Christmas is calling People ask me, are you selling those? No, you can buy one. I guess I'll buy them for you. Um, and it said either accept or reject. It looked like an iPhone, you know, Christmas is calling. What do we do? And I guess that's a, that's a great thing. We have to ask ourselves, hey, you know what? Christmas is here. Are we going to accept it? Are we going to do something with it? Because everybody wants some information that will change our life. And many of us, we come to Christmas and we have lots of traditions. So that's my word to, to kick this off for a few minutes. And it's really different. The message is short. We're going to do something really, really different to close here this week in particular. So Christmas is traditions. I, I'm a very traditional person when it comes to Christmas. I guess there are a few things that I've changed through the years, but mostly what my mom and dad did for Christmas, my wife and I do for Christmas. Who, who finds yourself the same way? You're like, I have Christmas traditions because my parents did it, I do it. Anybody? Raise your hands. You're like, I don't know why we do it, but we do it. That's why we do it. Um, but traditions have changed through the years. Traditions are going away. I said one last week. If you remember last week, we kicked off some Christmas humor with Christmas cards. Uh, Christmas cards are going away. We don't do a lot of Christmas cards anymore. I guess we text each other, Merry Christmas. Uh, I've heard, I, I, I Googled this. It's pretty interesting. There was an article that came out a few weeks ago, Christmas traditions that are going away. Real trees. Who are real tree people? You have a real Christmas tree. Wow. So that's kind of the most of five services. Who are, who are fake tree people? Let's see some fake trees. And you buy the pine scent um, candle to make offset it, right? You got to have that. But you like the fake tree because it's like two pieces now. They have that little LED bar. You just stick it in there and the lights come on. As lazy Americans as we can be, right? Boom. Uh, this is depressing. Office parties are going away. According to Google, because of the pandemic and lots of especially urban places, bosses did away with the office party because of COVID. And now they're like, it works out better that we just don't do this anymore. We see each other every day anyway. Let's save some money. Uh, Christmas bonuses and gifts at your work are going away. So anybody uh, would like a Christmas bonus, but you're not going to get one. Let's see some hands. Who's getting a big fat Christmas bonus? You're not going to, I'm not raising my hand. They're going to hate me next to it, but that goes away. Um, giving gifts has kind of gone away through the years. We like to, here's an Amazon card or green goes with everything, right? Uh, brick and mortar shopping. Who still likes to shop at a store? Let's see some hands. Who doesn't do that at all? You're the Amazon person. You shop in your underwear. Who likes still going to the mall? Look at all the 80s teenagers in the room. Yeah! Orange Julius. I like to go to the mall. That's going away. So you can't think of traditions. And again, simple idea, but we're going to take it a step further. Christmas traditions abound. They're everywhere. You can't think of Christmas traditions in our culture without thinking of movies. 
What are the Christmas traditional movies that we watch? I'll kick it off. Ready? Number one, Die Hard. <laughs> You're like, that's not Christmas. It is true. The end of the, the end of the movie. Oh, the weather outside. I mean, it's a Christmas movie. All right, let's. That, I, I digress. Uh, how about Elf? Is that a big one for anybody? By the way, give it up for everybody watching online today. What's up? We got people watching the first service from the Czech Republic this morning. What's up, everybody? Even people in the Czech Republic watch Elf. Subtitles, Elf. How about uh, It's a Wonderful Life? That's traditional. Who watches that every Christmas morning? Because that's like that's the only thing on TV, right? It's a Wonderful Life. Okay, let's see Pathways family. That's so bad. This is a flat-out awful movie, by the way. <laughs> awful. But who's already watched it twice this year? Let's see some. <laughs> Brent, it's tradition. It's tradition. Okay. Um, Home Alone? <laughs> Movies, right? You're like, Brent, I can't get through the season without watching my favorite Christmas movie. What about Christmas music? Give it up for Sir Gus, everybody. I mean, you can't turn on the radio anymore without, like, every station playing Christmas songs. We hate it most of the year, but this time of year, we're like, oh, I love it. I just think of this. I think Gus, man, he can play everything. We've had fun through the years, and I'm like, Gus, you just bring back the spirit of Christmas. It's traditional. Now, I like that, Gus, but I was thinking more like Grandma got run over by a reindeer. I think that's... Everybody, sing it with me. Coming on from our house Christmas Eve. You might say there's no such thing as Santa. That's enough, right? We got to do that. Gus, anything else to get us in the Christmas musical traditional moment? Now that's that's Brent and Gus moment right there. Very traditional. Sleigh bells ring in the lane. Rain is glistening. Everybody, just the balcony. Perfect. Give it up for Gus, everybody. <laughs> How about food? You're like, Brent, let's get spiritual. Okay, food. How about food? Um, let's go with food. I guess this is traditional fruitcake. You're like, Brent, some traditions are going away, and that's one of them. Who still eats fruitcake? Let's see some hands. Four of you. That's wonderful. How about this? The Christmas cookies will be in heaven, right? I mean, that's going to be in heaven. Got to have Christmas cookies. Don't blame the holidays. I was fat in August. Y'all remember that last week. Ham? Nothing like a good old Christmas ham. Whose mama makes ham? Let's see some ham. And you're thinking to yourself, mama, why didn't you get honey baked ham? For me, I'm jonesing for this lately. Ready? A good cut of prime rib. I like that. Amen. Some of you vegetarians are like, ah. don't get offended. You're not going to rush the stage anyway. You're too weak. So, um... <laughs> Uh, more meat for me, right? I love that. Uh, I'm a Christian. I don't do this, but eggnog? Apparently, somebody walked out and said, Waggles has really good eggnog. So I'm assuming that's non-alcoholic, right? Perfect. Christmas activities, um, going to see Christmas lights. We like it, except we've gotten lazy now. We don't even drive around streets anymore. We just go to the Smoky Stadium and sniff the car in front of us and pay $90 to get claustrophobic because the little old person in front of you is going two miles an hour and you're like me, you're right. My wife's like, why are you rushing? I'm like, well, let's go. And if they don't move, I'm just going to zing through the lights and get out of here. Anyway, um, gifts is still traditional, right? Even though they seem to be going away, we like to do that. There's something really special about that. Let's keep going. Just activities here, visiting family. That's We, we kind of took that for granted, and now we, we love to do that. Visiting Santa. Some of you parents like to take your kids to see Santa. My granddaughter hates Santa Claus. She's such a good little Christian girl. I love her. Hates it. Um, Santa's something we do, shopping again, go, just, just going out into the season. And it, we're going to talk about that next week. The idea of Christmas is what? Is it, is it getting or is it giving? Traditions. There's nothing wrong with traditions. But yet, is, it, does it change your life? Does it matter? Not really. 
I think, I think there's a lot of us in this room, even right now, that you feel like something's wrong. Life's not firing correctly. We have pockets of people in this building right this second. You're dealing with anxiety, a lot of stress. If, if you were honest, even a lot of pain. And I don't care how much you watch Christmas Vacation or you drink eggnog or eat prime rib. It doesn't really do anything to affect you. And I think people, I feel at this time of year more than ever, people are like, Brent, what information can you possibly give me to affect my life? Things that we do that are very traditional, but yet it's got to go beyond that. So for me this year, here, here we go, ready? Christmas needs to not just be traditional. That's fine. It needs to be treasured. Christmas is treasure. So Luke 2.19 is an interesting verse of Scripture. The birth of Jesus has taken place. We read it in Luke chapter 2. We get to verse 19, and there's just an interesting little verse of Scripture that to me is pretty powerful, and it says this, Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. And I'm going to back up, hopefully, guys, on the screen. Let's just go back up and put the definition of treasure on the screen because traditions are just, hey, that's just stuff we pass from one generation to the next. But treasure, I mean, to really think about that word treasure is something that has great worth or value. That's what we're looking for, to hold or keep as precious. And the Bible speaks to Mary going through what she went through, and it says she treasured all these things in her heart. She pondered this massive moment in human history. So I want you to think about this. Super simple, but this is just how my simple brain works, especially this time of year. The word ponder, we don't use that word anymore. What word do we use in place of ponder in our society? Reflect. We don't do that anymore. Most of us are on our phones so much we are moving so quickly. I laugh anymore and go, well, you know, Christmas is a hustle and bustle of the season. Christmas is hustle and bustle. Is every day hustle and bustle? I think it's every day. We're worn out. We don't contemplate. We don't reflect. We don't meditate. Many of us, and we wonder why we have all this anxiety and all this depression and all everybody, and even this time of year magnifies all that. And Mary teaches us something that I believe is important, that tr Christmas, if you want it to matter, has to go to the word treasure, has to go to the idea of ponder. Now, ponder is an interesting word here biblically. It really means this, reaching for understanding or not fully understanding. Mary is not fully understanding all that's taken place, and we try to wrap our minds around this magnificent moment and man, we struggle to do that. We struggle to stop. If I was to stop talking, I've done that before, I won't do it now, but just kind of take a minute and just be quiet. It will freak us all out, Brent. Talk. This is odd. But there are times that you need to ponder. Now, I grew up and it was traditional because my dad taught me. I'll just tell you, we would lay under the tree and stare up at the lights. You're like, really? Yeah. He did it. I'd still do it as a grown man. You're like, that's creepy. Now, don't do it by myself. That would be creepy. I did it with my kids growing up, but now the next generation has come, and my little granddaughter, Livy, I teach her how to sit under the tree. It took me a while because she was like, how do I get under the tree? And then my, my daughter texted me the other night this picture because now, Livy, this is her favorite thing to do now. And if this doesn't in a picture show you what Christmas should be, there's no other picture that will show you that. To think about a child and how she's embraced the idea of, hey, you know what, I want to stare up through these lights and I want to ponder this season. And she doesn't even get it yet. She does not fully understand yet what is happening. But I'm going to teach her like I taught my kids. Hey, you know, we need to stop. Sometimes we just need to lay under the tree. And you're like, Brent, are you giving me permission to lay under my Christmas tree this afternoon? Yes. But you don't have to do that, to stop and think about what matters. So it's interesting. The other night I was watching CW, that station. It's a network station. Is it CW, I think, or whatever it is? Or C, whatever. I don't, typically don't watch that. It's a really woke network, in my opinion. But they had a special on. I don't know if some of you saw the special. It kind of stopped me in my tracks. It was the history of the song, Silent Night. 
Anybody see it? CW, I think it was. Two of us, wonderful. Two hours, they sang Silent Night in every language across the globe. And this girl, this is really almost just, oh, it made me want to jump through the TV and just look at her and say, you are dumb. But she was right. She was French. She was singing in her favorite French voice, Palibou Francais. You could see the Eiffel Tower, and she had that real Frenchy, fry-type voice. <laughs> I don't know. That's a bad. And she was singing Silent Night. It was awesome. And then they interviewed her. And they're like, what do you think about this song? And here's what she said. Listen to this. This is insane. She goes, well, this song is originally, I know it's supposed to be like a Christianity song. And then she said this, but it's transcended that. Now it's a song for humanity. I'm thinking, you are the dumbest person I am. But she's right. Because it has transcended just Christianity. God so loved the world that he came for humanity. And there's really no other song. It was written 206 years ago, first sang on Christmas Eve 204 years ago, and it's a song that we grew up with. We don't need to put the lyrics on the screens. We know it. It's the air that we breathe. And it's the greatest ponder song that I know. And if you and I will stop, which is very hard to do, some of you right now, you're like, oh, I want to check my phone. I'm thinking what we're doing after church. I got to go to the bathroom. Brent said eggnog. That sounds good right now. I think we Can we stop? I know we can't wrap our minds around everything that God did for us, but God did something so unique, so special that goes beyond the Christmas season all the way to the cross where Jesus would die on a cross and rise again to conquer the keys of death, hell, and the grave and take our sin. But it did all start with Emmanuel, God with us. It, I had a conversation with a couple people a few weeks ago, and they look at me and they're like, well, Brent, you don't know what I'm going through. You're right, but God does. God would send his only son, his only son, to die on a cross that you and I might have peace and life. I'd never do that. A couple weeks ago, I spent two days with my son. He's in this room. Just he and I. I love my daughter. I love my son equally. But boy, there's something that when I can spend time with my children just one-on-one, -on -one, and it's hard to do with my daughter anymore. She's married and got a child. But Mason and I, he still lives at home. And I'm just, I just know those days are coming to an end. And I looked at him when we were together, and I just kind of put my hand on his knee. And I said, Mason, you'll never know how much I love you. I'm for you. No one no one, I'm telling you, I wouldn't give up you for anyone. I'm so proud of you. I can't believe that I'm your dad. I, I wish you could feel the love that I have for you. And I think what God did, and you parents, you, you put that in your mind and in your heart. You ponder that for a while, that God would give up his only son for you and for me and the choices that we've made. That should affect you. The idea of pondering, reflecting, you realize science today is now showing. When you and I stop and reflect, it decreases stress. It builds our physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual well-being. When we just ponder, we stop and reflect on what matters. I mean, it decreases stress and it builds well-being. And look around, how's that going for us all, especially this time of year? We really struggle. Maybe we've we're needing to take the idea of Christmas is tradition and ch change it into Christmas is treasure. How about this verse of Scripture to ponder on? John 1.14, the Word became flesh, made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only who came, full, who came from the Father full of grace and mercy. And it all started... With Emmanuel, God, you are with us. So I'll go back. Let's just stop for two seconds before we take communion together and bring it all home. Can you sing this with me? Silent. You know it. Holy night. Oh.
Christmas we like to leave Christ in the crib, but Christ went to the cross. Let's ponder that. Let's celebrate that, what God did for us. Remember that. And it changes us. It affects us. It matters. So would you peel off that top layer if you have your communion element and peel off that bottom layer and hold that juice in your hands at home. I know Pastor Mike has just given you an invitation to take communion with us and anything that's in your kitchens that's appropriate. Would you take that bread and would you break it? Would you eat it and would you remember the body of Jesus Christ? Emmanuel, God with us, who can understand and who loves us. Would you take that juice and would you drink it? In the Old Testament book of Isaiah, chapter 53, the great prophet's going to give us about 700 years before Jesus would be born a picture of the Messiah. So many of us today miss the Messiah because the Messiah did not come the way we would expect the Messiah to come. Just listen to this. Who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up like a tender shoot, like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing is in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by man, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from people from whom people hide their faces. He was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took our pain, he bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. And he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace will be on him and by his wounds will be healed. There are 525,600 minutes in a year. I know that because I saw the Broadway musical Rent and they sang it, Seasons of Love. 525,000 seasons. It's a pretty interesting thing I think about. Maybe it's just what I do, but it's just my mind. Because when I struggle with pockets of anxiety, and I do, when I struggle with pain, when I struggle with seasons of loss, and I struggle with, man, I can't believe the days have gone by and my life is passing me by, I think, of what can I do to redeem the moments? What can I do to redeem the season? I want to be a kid at Christmas, but... I'm getting older. Well, I can take some time and I can remember the things that matter. I can reflect on what matters. And we might call it tradition, but it's got to go beyond that. So out of the 525,600 minutes that we've gone through this year, I want us to take 10 this week out of order, different. We typically never do it this week, but I want us to stop and I want us to take 10 minutes and I want us to ponder, to reflect, to be very still and to think about moments that matter. Now I ask our services all week, just really be still in this moment. Give me 10 minutes of your 525,600 minutes and let's go back. 10 minutes out of 525,600 minutes represents point zero 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 one percent of our time this year. But it does matter. I ask our Wednesday night at 7 o'clock service, which we have 100 teenagers sitting in. Guys, relax. You would think, Brent, good luck with that. You could hear a pin drop for 10 minutes because there are things that we call tradition, but we need to treasure. God, be in this moment. Be in this last 10 minutes of this service. Be in this Pathways tradition that speaks. It speaks. It just speaks. There's nothing we can do to add to it. It just matters the most. Be in this moment. Settle our spirits. Allow us to engage with childlike wonder. 
In Jesus' name. Three things we should never lose, a sense of wonder, a heart of gratitude, it's so easy to do, and an awareness of God's grace. So what I want to do this week is once again lock in on a tradition, just like the kids, but let's take it beyond for a moment and just be grateful, treasure the meaning of Christmas and the love of God for us all. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father and Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David, and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be, man to, to be married to a man named Joseph. Joseph was a descendant of King David. The angel Gabriel appeared to Mary and said, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could possibly mean. Don't be frightened, Mary, the angel told her. God has chosen to bless you. You will become pregnant and you are to have a son and you are to name him Jesus. He will be great. He will be called the son of the most high. But Mary asked the angel, how can I have a baby? I am a virgin. The angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby born to you will be holy. And he will be called the Son of God. So while Mary was still a virgin, she became pregnant by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her fiancé, being a just man, decided to break the engagement quietly so as not to disgrace Mary publicly. As he considered this, he fell asleep, and an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said. Don't be afraid to go ahead with your marriage to Mary, for the child in her has been conceived by the Holy Spirit. She will have a son. You are to name him Jesus. He will save his people from their sins. All of this happened to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Behold, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son. He will be called Emmanuel, meaning God with us. This prophecy from the Old Testament book of Isaiah was given 700 years before Jesus would be born. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him to do. He brought Mary home to be his wife, but she remained a virgin until her son was born. And at that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. All had to return to their own towns to register for this census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. So he traveled from the village of Nazareth to Galilee and took with him Mary, his wife, who was great with child. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her first child, a son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger. That night... There were shepherds in the fields outside the village guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terribly frightened, but the angel reassured them. Do not be afraid, he said. I bring good news of great joy for everyone. Yes, 
a Savior, the Messiah. The Lord has been born tonight in Bethlehem, the city of David. And this is how you will recognize him. You will find a baby lying in a manger, wrapped in swaddling clothes. And suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host from heaven, the armies of heaven, praising God, saying, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward all men. The angels left, and the shepherds said to each other, Come, let's go to Bethlehem and see this wonderful thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they ran to the village, and they found Mary and Joseph. And there was the baby lying in the manger. The shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this particular child. All who heard their story were astonished. But Mary kept these things in her heart, the shepherds went back to their fields and flocks, glorifying and praising God. Jesus Christ was born in the town of Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. And at the same time came wise men from the east to Jerusalem asking, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We've seen his star that arose and have come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed by their question, as was all of Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law. Where did the prophets say the Messiah would be born, he asked. In Bethlehem, they said. For this is what the prophets of old wrote, O Bethlehem of Judea, you're not just a lowly village of Judah, for a ruler will come to you who will be the shepherd for all people. This prophecy found in the Old Testament book of Micah, the Old Testament book of 2 Samuel, both given to us 700 years before Jesus would be born. So King Herod sent a message to the wise men, asking them to come see him. At this meeting, he learned the exact time when they first saw the star, and then he told them, go to Bethlehem, search diligently for this child, when you find him, come and tell me that I may go and worship him too. After this meeting, the wise men went on their way. And once again, the star appeared to guide them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house where the child and his mother were, and they fell down and worshipped him. They opened their treasured chest and gave him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. But when it was time to go home, the wise men went home another way because God had warned them in a dream, do not return to King Herod. After the wise men were gone, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, flee to Egypt with the child and his mother, the angel said. Stay there until I tell you to return, because King Herod is going to try and kill this child. That very night, Joseph left for Egypt with the child and Mary, his mother, and they stayed there until King Herod's death. This fulfilled what the Lord had spoken through the prophet out of Egypt will I call my son. King Herod was furious when he had learned the wise men had outwitted him. He sent soldiers to kill all the baby boys in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under because the wise men had told him that the star had first appeared to them about two years before. And later, when King Herod died, God's angel appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. Get up, take the child and his mother and return to Israel. All those who wish to murder the child are now dead. So Joseph obeyed. He arose and he took the child and his mother and they re-entered Israel. When Joseph heard though that King Herod's son had taken over as king of Judea, he was afraid. But then Joseph was directed in a dream to go to the hills 
of Galilee. On arriving, he settled in the village of Nazareth, fulfilling the words of the prophets of old, Jesus Christ shall be called a Nazarene. For God so loved the world that he would give his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So you ask me what Christmas is. This is Christmas. So what does that do for you? When you hear that, you're like, Brenna, I've heard that before. Why would you read that again? Is it just some sense of tradition? Is there something that makes us not want to stop and be grateful and ponder that God would give his only son in such a lowly way to come and identify with everybody? That Christ would go from the cradle to the cross to the grave and would rise again. Providentially, somehow, some way, just a few weeks ago, I thought, you know, I don't know if I want to read the Christmas story again. We've been doing it a long time, and we're not that traditional, but yet the kids singing and this story seem to fit just to once again stop with childlike faith, be grateful for Emmanuel. God, that moment that Christ would come for us all. God, we thank you for this day. It's really different for me. Just, it's not really a normal kind of week, but boy, it's special, it's needed. We celebrate Christmas traditions, but we need to treasure what matters more. So this season, may we stop, may we reflect not just on Christ coming as a, as a baby, but on the cross, the mission that you would send your only son so we can have life. And even this time of year, we can experience brand new things. This year is over. What will the next year hold? We can flip the calendar and we can start with a blank page and we can be so grateful for our sins being forgiven. So God, yeah, we need to come back to you. We need this moment to matter. We don't want to go through the motions and we don't want this to be familiar for sure. We're coming back to our first love. Let us all just be grateful. Even in the midst of this crazy time that we live in, just to stop in this moment and be thankful. We're thankful. We love you. We love you. Man, we love you. In Jesus' name.